Hey everybody, it's Payments Professor here and welcome to the Payments Podium. We're going to have some fun today. We're going to but we're going to th keep things between in the guardrails and keep it safe. In fact, we're going to talk about safeguarding or well, I should say the safeguard rule. And to talk about the safeguard rule, we've got Nancy McKenzie from Affirmative Technologies joining us. Welcome to the Payments Podium, Nancy. Hey, thank you, Payments Professor. I'm really happy to be here with you today. All right, so the safeguard rule, there's this new rule, it's the safeguard rule. And I gotta tell you, I know very little about it. I, I, you know, a little backstory for those listening, Nancy and I were talking about this at a conference just a couple of weeks ago. And I was like, just stop, we gotta record this because this is new, this is exciting stuff. So would you start off by just giving us the, you know, 10,000 foot level, what is the safeguard rule? Well, first off, the safeguard rule is not new. It's been out there since 2002. It's just been revised. Now, they, the safeguard rule is part of the Gramm-Leach-Bliley Act, so the GLBA, and in within that act, we have a rule called the safeguard rule, and it is governed by the FTC. The FTC started talking about revising a part of the safeguard rule back in 2016 because there was a little confusion as to who it re related to. We knew it related to financial institutions, but people like affirmative technologies and other financial industry, like service providers or players, fintechs, they, they just we didn't know where we all fit in. So they started talking about it in 2016 and when the pandemic hit and everybody was going online and people were doing you know things electronically, they were like, okay, we need to make a decision. So December 9th of 2021, they finally came up with the revisions to the safeguarding rule. So wait a minute. This is one of those, again, it's been around for a long time. If we go to GL, GLBA, that is really something that's been there to help consumers, help protect consumers and the things mm -hmm. that they do, very strong in there. But governed by the Federal Trade Commission, that's definitely a little different and interesting because usually things in payments, it's not the Federal Trade Commission that we worry mm -hmm. about. There's so many other organizations. And is this another one of those that, you know, maybe because of the pandemic, it helped to get it accelerated, even though, got to point out, even though it had already got started well before the pandemic. Right. So, yeah, they just uh, needed to take a better focus in on the trades. I mean, you know, the companies, the organizations, not necessarily directly at the financial institutions. And I do have to correct myself. I said that it was out there since 2002. That's when it was starting to be talked about, but it was approved in 2003. Okay. Okay. We'll I give you a, a pass on that one. Close okay. enough. <laughs> All right. So the safeguard rule, that's a little history, but what is it really? I mean, it, you said it applies to financial institutions, mm -hmm. but it's been expanded recently. And that's the big deal is it's been expanded recently to apply more to say the fintechs and the processors yeah. that are out there, right? Yeah, right. Well, so the safeguard rule is really very similar to what it actually says. It's safeguarding customer information, consumer information, as the Graham Leach Bliley Act is really directed a lot at privacy, privacy laws and, and the necessity to determine who are you sharing information with. And uh, I don't know about you, Kevin, but I remember because I was in part of the financial institution when the Graham Leach Bliley Act was put into play and we had to determine how are we going to give the notices to our customers as far as opting in or opting out, right? And that whole business and really who was an affiliate and did we have affiliates and hmm, how do we determine if we had affiliates? It was a huge conversation we had back then because there was still a lot of questions. Well, in the same respect, when you're talking about the safeguard rule, it's protecting customer or consumer information and wait, let me what, stop you real quick just in case uh -huh. for people listening i want everybody to also recognize and understand before glba graham leach Biley act there was still privacy data was protected financial institutions didn't just suddenly start doing it because of that they'd already been doing it but what graham leach Biley act 
did is it put in higher specifications and exact requirements of what had to be met for the financial institution. So if anybody out there thinks, oh man, we didn't have anything before, we did. In fact, yeah. since we started using computers, we did the best in, in, in all industries I'm aware of, and especially mm -hmm. in banking, we did the best we knew how at the time, but uh -huh. this was just something that took it to another level. Right, and really, you know, a lot of the data protection that we are using within the electronic payment system was derived from the cards, right? Right. Cards were introduced very first, you know, and wire transfers. So, yeah, you're exactly right. Data was protected. But the safeguarding rule really put into place specifics that you needed to have within a security information program. So the the first thing that the safeguard rule and the update, the approved update that they came up with on December 9th of 2021 went into effect January 9th of 2021, I'm sorry, 2022. And then it was supposed to actually be effective, compliance effective wise, by December 9th of 2022. Okay. Now, well, what is it? Wait, 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 what is this number one? You're giving me all these dates. I want to know what it is. What safeguarding rule is protecting it. Like I said, you have to have certain components within your security information program. Okay. Okay. What components? So, yeah, so there's there's several of them. So let me let me give you the very first one is that you need to have a qualified individual to oversee your company's information security program. Now, who is a qualified individual? It's going to be somebody who has not necessarily certain degrees or certain certifications. I mean, that of course is going to be a good way to seal the deal that you've got a qualified person. But it basically is stating that the background of that person running a, your organization is going to have the experience and knowledge behind what it takes for your information security to protect the data that you hold for consumers. Oh, okay. And so, I know that yes. one's important because yes. so that's I've never the seen this step. at a bank, but I got to tell you, back in my IT days, I saw in the early days of IT too, where I'd go to some companies, not necessarily tech companies before anybody jumps the gun, but I'd go to some companies and their IT department or their computer setups were done because, well, I got a cousin or I got a nephew that, you know, they know how to do this stuff. Did they have an IT degree? No. Did they have a background in it? No. They just happen to understand how to set up a router. That was about it. So yeah. there were good reasons for having qualified individuals actually listed out, even though I know Absolutely. some people go, yeah. that seems like a no brainer. In the first uh, write up of this rule, they specified at first that you needed to have a CISO um, employed, but then they took that out and they just said a qualified individual. Now that's one thing. Second thing is you have to conduct a company risk assessment. That's number two. Number three, you need to design well, and implement. Well, let's safeguards. talk about that risk assessment for a real quick oh, minute because again, okay. it's important because what's a risk at its basics? What a risk? What's a risk assessment do? A, ris a risk assessment is going to identify the risk that you are exposed to in whatever line of business that you are in. Okay, so you need to identify those risks, determine how am I going to have controls in place and what are those controls to mitigate the risks because you're never going to eliminate risk. You're only going to reduce it to an amount where you're going to feel comfortable enough that you're not going to be having a exposure to that risk. Okay, now is that something that is the same for absolutely every organization or is the risk absolutely very different by organization? Absolutely not. And here's another thing about a risk assessment, Kevin, is that one person in the organization usually is responsible for making certain the risk assessment is completed, but you cannot have one person do that risk assessment. It takes the entire organization. There is no way that I would know all about my security information that my IT people or my developers are involved with. I don't have any idea, but they don't know what I'm involved with either. So it takes everybody. Okay. On to number three. What's number three? Number three is to design and implement safeguards to control the risks identified through your risk assessment. So isn't that funny how they just tied those two together? Now, there's several items under that particular 
topic. They have actually um, eight items that are included in what the implementation of those safeguards would be. And those things are going to be um, things such as implementing periodic review access controls. So in other words, the individuals that work in your organization, who has access to that data and for what purpose? And do they really need to have access to that data? Right. So you need to do what's called an access review. And you should do this on about at least a six month basis to, because things change. Employees uh, roles change. Maybe they uh, have people being added on or, or removed. So we need to review access controls. All right. Beyond those access controls, then what else needs to be done? Well, we need to know what data you have and where is it. So that needs to be identified. Um, and then with that data, um, we need to make certain it's encrypted. You know, encrypted when it's in transit, encrypted when it's at rest. We need to make certain that we are not going to be able to have somebody look at that data that doesn't have the authorization to. We now, need I wonder to how many people out there got to go, you got to know where your data is. Don't you just know it's saved to here or here? And I know this too, because when it comes to payments processing, those of you who are listening and learning more about it, you're probably realizing that, you know, seeing, sending a single payment could involve multiple third parties, let's say, or processes or organizations. You could have the company that helps you to send the payment. You could have the company that does the fraud detection on the payment. You could have the company that does the OFAC compliance risk detection on the payment as well. And, and there could be others for other purposes that are involved. And each one of those companies may or may not be saving data in different locations or accessing it from different locations. And that is why it is such a big deal to know, well, how does the payment flow? What's happening at what step? Who does what? And where's that data saved, actually saved at? Yes, yes. So the next one within that category, and remember, we're still talking about the fact that we need to design and implement safeguards to control the risks identified through your risk assessment, right? So we're still talking about that. So if the organization or the, the company has apps, we need to make certain that that data is um, evaluated through the app too. Um, and then we're going to make certain we've got implementation of multi-factor authentication for anyone who has access to that data. We're going to need to make sure that we have that customer information that is destroyed, that it's disposed of properly, and how that's done. And it goes on to say within that section that um, that customer information should um, be destroyed and disposed of within two years after it was, it, there wasn't any use to it anymore. So you can't keep it for longer than two years. I, that's actually a lot of good information there too, because mm -hmm. I can, I, again, going back to my IT days or even some of the early days of remote deposit capture, when it came to destroying the checks, we had to say, you're going to specifically destroy it in this method because we didn't, you know, people have to realize if somebody got that check, having that data, they could do some real harm fraud wise. So it had to be securely destroyed. It couldn't just be destroyed. And well, we're just going to burn them all. Well, you know, if you've ever burned a stack of papers, it doesn't actually burn everything and they could still get the data off of it. So I do see why that's important. Or even the early days of hard drives, you could hit delete and all it really did was mark a sector as being blank, but the data was still there. And somebody who knew what they were doing could actually still retrieve that data. So I love seeing that. I love seeing the multi-factor authentication too. Again, yeah. that one could be annoying. I know you're probably like me and all y'all listening are like me too and being like, what's my password to this one? And what do you mean I got to get a, you know, a code and I got to use a separate app? Well, those levels of what we call friction are good at certain levels. And, and for me in a financial institution or a company, like in this case, working with the financial institution, I want y'all to have some friction because I want my data protected. Right. So now we also need to anticipate and evaluate changes to your information system. So in other words, we need to, once it's built, we need to manage and monitor it. We need to review it, test it, make any changes necessary and continue it in a rotating basis, right? Rinse and repeat is what I like to say. So we need to make certain that the um, information systems are reviewed. 
And then we now, need to- Now, is there any like requirements for how the managing takes place for the monitoring, for the frequency of testing? Is there any type of requirements or recommendations that are even out there for how that should be done? Because I know you said earlier that access needs to be reviewed every six months, which I think is yeah. great because you know people quit, people move jobs. What about in the managing, monitoring and testing? You know, they don't really come out and say anything specific, but you know, the FFIEC's um, examination manuals, they really lend towards the, depending on what your risk that you have identified um, will really determine on how often you do those reviews. When I get asked the question, you know, a real good way to make certain that it's being done is just do it on an annual basis. Get yourself into a system, a routine, and um, you may need to do it more often, especially if your environment changes, if you're uh, right, <laughs> if your environment changes, I don't know, maybe a pandemic or some strange thing, a hurricane or whatever, you know, you might new need head to of it. IT, new, new software gets installed. Yeah. yeah, I agree. I completely agree. Yeah. Yeah. So um, it's really dependent on on what risks are identified for that organization, which we do once we get done talking about this part of the safeguard rule, Kevin, I really would like to go back and, and discuss of who we're talking about. Who are we talking about here? It, like I said, it we were wait, wait, wait. Let's do it now. Who are we talking about, Nancy? Who are we talking about? <laughs> well, um, in the safeguard rule, um, there is a definition of who a financial institution is. Now, in our easy terms, a financial institution is going to be a credit union or a bank, right? Right. But they really extend it out and they call them finders. Finders are the buyers and sellers of somebody who is giving a financial pro product or a service. So that really opens up the definition of who a financial institution is. Within the safeguarding rule, they relate back to the um, Banking Act of 1956, believe it or not. And back in 1956, during the Banking Act, it lists out um, the individuals that were actually going to be required to follow the, the Banking Act itself. So the safeguarding rule it relates back to that, but it does give a list of who definitely, or examples, I'll say, of who is um, in you know organizations that are required to do this. And then it also gives examples of individuals or organizations that are not required to do this. So for right, example, I want examples of because you start mentioning Banking Act, who's allowed to actually do banking where we talk about it. I don't know about you, but when I'm talking to my friends and family, I am telling them all the time, folks, Venmo, Cash App, those are not banks. They are not giving you the same protection that is required. I'm not saying they're not giving you protection. They do. But I'm not. I know that they're not under the same scrutiny or requirements of an actual bank though. So when we say who are examples, can you tell us what that looks like? Yeah, there's actually quite a long list. So I'm, I'm not gonna go over all of them, but they do have a, a lot of um, descriptions such as auto dealerships, um, personal property or real estate appraisers, um, tax preparers, uh, people that are doing check cashing businesses, accountants, um, but the one that is really the catch-all is that uh, company acting as a finder and bringing together one or more buyers and sellers of any product or service for transactions that the parties themselves are going to negotiate with a financial institution. So that really opens up a lot of individuals within the financial industry, such as Affirmative Technologies. We provide a service. We are a third-party service provider to financial institutions so that they can transact their ACH transactions, they can monitor them, we give risk management, um, these types of things. But really anybody who is a vendor of a financial institution is going to be required to have this information security program put in place. Um, and I was throwing out dates earlier, Kevin, right? right. We were like, oh gosh, don't tell me there's a quiz all of a sudden because I'm not ready. <laughs> I didn't tell you the answer, so I'm going to tell you the answer now. We were supposed to be compliant, effective December 9th of 2022, okay? Oh. But but the FTC was getting some comments from organizations, and they were like, we aren't ready. 
So they extended it out another six months. So a lot of individuals that weren't ready, they were like, whoo, now we got a lot of six months, another six months. But guess when? That six months is up. June 9th of 2023, right around the corner. It's only yeah, from this ahead. recording it is. This, now this will probably be live when people listen to it. Uh, it will be past June 9th, but we're right just a week or two before that happening. So that's that's a pretty big deal. It is a big deal. So when we're talking about who is not a financial institution under the um, terms of the safeguarding rule, it's going to be, as I have mentioned, like a broker dealer, commodity futures trading commission um, under the Commodity Exchange Act. Anybody that's listed in there, they would not be subject to this. Um, the federal so like my stock broker. That's not a bank. That's my stock sure. broker. They they do receive money coming in from my account from my bank to be able to move stocks around, though. But that's what they do. Well, and I got to tell you, FINRA that really oversees all of their regulatory <laughs> obligations. It's very, very stringent. So they aren't getting away scot-free. They still have a lot of other things that they have to abide by. Nancy, side note, let me share with you, uh, the, the actual broker that I do use just got bought or re got bought last year by another broker, a really large one. And the conversion process, the amount of agreements I had to go through that I got sent, and you know, I'm that weird guy who reads them all. I couldn't even read all these. It was just so much. It was like, are you kidding me? I mean, I had to be hand walked to be able to move this account. And I really didn't move my account. My account's exactly the same. It's just somebody else, another business took ownership of it, you know, on my behalf type deal. It was insane. I mean, I've made changes at banks. I have changed banks and credit unions before, but I have this this was a six month long process that I felt like every week I had to stop and give a DNA sample and, you know, my all kinds of other information and say, here you go. I'm OK with it. So, yeah, I get that different levels. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, you're right. Um, institutions that are chartered by Congress aren't subject to this. And um, anybody that will engage in financial um, activities that are not significantly engaged with a financial institution aren't. So that that kind of, a, I feel, is a little bit of a gray area. But the point being is that this really requires your third-party service providers that are giving any products or services to financial institutions, you better be making certain your security information program is in place and up to speed with the safeguarding rule. That's a lot to it. Now, Okay, we've talked a, a, a lot. Is there any of the other steps that maybe we need to go back into or are we, are we good? Because this safeguarding done. rule, I think, is a big deal. Yeah, we're, we're not done. <laughs> oh, we're not done. Okay, we might be running out of time. Let's go on then. What, what, what are okay, the other? So, Let, let's start um, getting just the key, key ones people need to know. Yeah, it, we're, there's not very many more here. So um, key ones, uh, we need to monitor our program. We already said that. But right. here's a big one. We need to train our staff. They need to know about our information security program and how they're supposed to be making certain that the data is secured. And the payments professor approves that message. <laughs> Absolutely. Training is so important. And as, as people like us who have worked in education for years, we understand. And anybody out there listening going, how do you guys get to be this level of payments nerd? It is from the training. It is working with the people in the training. If you really want to get good at this stuff, you go teach it to somebody else and watch what happens. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I've only been doing this just over 37 years. So yeah, it just took me a day or two to learn all of this. Um, we need to monitor our service providers, Kevin. What does that mean? Oh, vendor risk management programs need to be put in place. Okay. Um, keep your um, information security program current. So updates, patches, backups, everything like that, that you need to do to keep your systems up and going and nice and secure, you got to get that routine in place. Uh, we need a, a written incident response plan, a written one, not one that, hey, um, something happens, I'm just going to call up Kevin and go, uh, we got a problem, what are we going to do? <laughs> right? We need a written one. Clear roles and responsibilities for the individuals involved in that. And finally, and definitely not the least important, probably the most important, is that your qualified individual must report all of the occurrences, your activity, and all of the results from audits, 
risk assessments to your board of directors. Your board of directors must have the understanding and knowledge of the oversight responsibilities that they have over your security information program. So that's what the safeguarding rule is all about and the steps that we need to make certain are in place for our security information program. Okay, now there's a couple things I wanna ask because first of all, you and I have heard a lot of the news headlines that are not true about how Fed now coming out is going to monitor everything you do with your payments. Is the safeguarding rule and it coming out and what you know with what happens with banks, credit unions, other institutions, fintechs involved, does anybody ever stop and look at the details of a payment and then report it to Congress or report it to IRS saying this is all the stuff that's happening on a regular basis on your normal payments? No, but could they? Yes. Could they? Yes. The potential is always there. I get that. And, it, it, and yeah. another one I like to tell them too, is they can also track your cash to a certain extent, just so you yes. know. Okay. Exactly. But they certainly can. The situations where they do actually look for things, what kind of situations are those? I mean, cause Fraudulent. I'm a fan of those. <laughs> oh yeah. And I want people to know well, what they are. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's suspicious, right? It's a suspicious transaction. So why is it suspicious? Well, because it's not normal for that person. It's not normal for the industry. I mean, um, Nancy McKenzie all of a sudden is starting to get payments from Cash App at $5,000 a pop 10 times a day. What? That's not right. So are you going to look at Nancy's transactions to see what's going on? Of course you are, because that could lead to a potential, I don't know, maybe I'm a money mule, I'm a victim, but maybe I'm the bad guy. Regardless, the um, AML uh, programs that- Any money laundering. Have, Yes, anti-money laundering, sorry, our acronym talk sometimes gets in our way. Yeah. <laughs> but our AML programs require us to do this monitoring. And if we do find that there is some suspicion behind it, we are, as a financial institution, required to fill a suspicious activity report or an SAR, which, yes, is going to be really, really reviewed to determine, is this truly a fraudulent transaction? Is this part of other transactions that are fraudulent too? Is this a ring of people that are bad right. guys? Well, let, let's just point out all we're really looking for in the industry, and this is in all of our payment channels, all of our payment channels. What we are looking for is we want to make sure that we're not funding terrorism. We want to make sure that we're not funding child pornography, that we're not funding human trafficking, that these are not funds that are going to things that nobody should want to allow or have happen. So if there's enough suspicion to cause the financial institutions to do an investigation, they do. And mm -hmm. if they find enough evidence to say it is something bad, it is reported. If there's not, if there's not, if they don't find anything, they don't report anything because there's nothing to report. So just because you got money coming into your account, that doesn't mean it gets reported or that it even gets looked at to certain levels and details. But the rules are there to protect us as a society from the things that unfortunately do happen. And the banks are in a position and the credit unions are in a position to be able to help stop that. Now, That's I love the safeguarding rule. That's not exactly what the safeguarding rule is doing, everybody. You know, just to break it down, the safeguarding rule is really there to be able to have programs in place to go beyond just the banks and credit unions to what we call fintechs or service providers to also make sure that they are putting risk assessment plans in place, that they have qualified people to be able to look at these programs, that they know who's accessing the programs, that they are identifying the risks that are gonna be specific to them, that they're, they're monitoring, they're managing, and they're doing what they're supposed to do to keep us safe when it comes to transferring our money. That's would you right. agree, Nancy? I would totally agree. You know, it, it's all about the conversations that I've had with several individuals about Alexa and she's listening to me and people are like, I don't, is your Alexa going up? Yeah. My Alexa's going up. <laughs> is she listening to me? Well, she might be because she, you know, she might be. Alexa, stop. 
<laughs> he was going off about accomplishing great things. And, uh, you know, we're, we're running out of time here. I got to say, we have accomplished some great things here today. Uh, everybody, if you want to get a hold of Nancy McKenzie, she's on LinkedIn. She's worth a, with Affirmative Technologies. If you can't find her, you can always email me, Kevin at PaymentsProfessor.com. I would love to put you in contact with her. I'm sure we'll have her back on the Payments Podium because she's a great friend of the Payments Professor and the Podium. And if there's a topic, if there's a speaker, somebody you want to have on the payments podium, uh, something you want to have addressed, again, email me, Kevin at paymentsprofessor.com. I will do my best to make sure that that gets taken care of. I know we're out of time today, and this is where I got to say, blast this mist.